Hi, this is Amy with Awakening with Amy, and I'm super excited to announce a new interview series and kicking it off with author and sound healer Elizabeth Huxtable. She wrote a beautiful book about her late daughter Lucy, and I had a wonderful time interviewing her, and I hope you enjoy as well. So welcome, Elizabeth, to my channel. I'm so honored to have you. I, um, You sent me an advanced copy of your book, and I read it, and I was just so, so blown away by the book. I literally got emotional within minutes of reading it. Wow. So today I have Elizabeth Huxtable. She wrote a book about her daughter, Lucy, and her life. And we'll be discussing her book, her journey in life, and all the reasons why she decided to write it. So I want to just give a brief introduction to Elizabeth so you all can get to know her better, and then we'll get into the interview. So Elizabeth was a research scientist, then an educator in Australia, a qualified massage therapist, Reiki practitioner, and after the passing of her daughter, Lucy, studied many healing modalities, including energy psychology, sound therapy, and biofield tuning. Because of her experience with her daughter, it led her to research how sound therapy can benefit special needs children. She feels there's a strong link with emotions and the mind-body connection. Children with special needs are often highly intuitive and sensitive, affected by the emotional energy of all those around them. So when working with children now, she focuses on the parents as well. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth currently resides in Malaysia, where she is a sound therapist and also teaches and works in Australia, Southeast Asia, and Europe. So happy to have you here. Thank you so much. I can't wait to hear more about your story. So first, could you just tell us a little bit about your journey and what really inspired you to write this beautiful book? Yes, I had my daughter, uh, wow, it's 27 years ago now. Uh, it's taken a long time for me to get to the point where I feel I can share this story. But I just felt that all the things I learned and a lot of the things I learned after she passed away to heal myself would benefit other people. And particularly, I was thinking about the parents who had special needs children. But as I was writing, I realized, no, this actually has a much wider appeal. It's not just for those parents. It's really for anyone who's struggling with traumas and with things not going right in their lives. And so I felt that my story might encourage and inspire others. That was really the motivation I had. It turned out to be very cathartic for me to write this book. Uh, and it's amazing, even though so many of the things happened so long ago, it brought it all back as I was writing. It was uh, quite a journey. <laughs> So what was the time frame from when Lucy passed on to when you decided I'm going to I'm ready I'm going to write a book about my life with my daughter. It was around 10 years after and it was actually a suggestion of a friend. She said, "I've got a message for you. You're going to write a book." And she even gave me the title. Oh. And uh, I didn't see her for 2 years. And she said, have you written that book yet? I said, no, I haven't started it. <laughs> but uh, it, it, I, in the back of my mind, I thought, I really need to do this. But I, I didn't know how to structure it because I don't have any training in this field. And I thought to myself, I need some professional help. I just stumbled upon a, a book coach who loved my work, my sound work, and was very impressed. And she approached me and she offered to help me with my sound work and to give me a free 30-minute uh, little talk, you know, just discussion. And when I discovered she was a book coach, I said to her, oh, this is what I've been looking for. And so 
that's when things could start moving because she brought the structure. I didn't know how to structure the story. And she did what she called an outline. She interviewed me for over two hours, asking me lots of questions. And then she put it all in, you know, chapter one, chapter two, ask me, answer these questions. And it was incredible. Her questions were things I'd never asked myself. And so I learned so much more about myself from answering her questions as I wrote the book. That is so powerful. I mean, because, you know, I have, when I started just really the first chapter one, I felt your emotions or what I perceived, you know, and what you're saying to me is that as souls in a physical body, it doesn't matter. It Those messages from your friend, just they lead you when you say yes, and you're willing to follow those urges of your soul, your higher self, whatever, whatever. I don't really know how it works, but it sounds like you were willing to just listen and follow those urges. And then what are the chances of her also being a book coach. I mean, so for anybody out there that is is questioning their urges, don't. This is proof. You should just follow them, (laughs) right? Yeah. And and the other thing is that it's really difficult for a first-time writer to even find a publishing company willing to read your manuscript. Oh, is Uh, that right? Yes, it's really difficult. Most of them just don't even want to read a, a new manuscript, a new writer's manuscript. But this lady, uh, she's a Canadian, and she knows personally the CEO of Manor House. And she said, your script is good enough quality for me to give it to him to read. And he read it and offered me a contract straight away. How did that feel? I, I couldn't believe at first. I, I thought this isn't really happening. Um, so it took me a while to even tell her he offered me the contract because I was had to digest the fact that it actually <laughs> happened. You're like, am I living in an alternate universe here? <laughs> yeah. So what were some of the most rewarding moments as you were writing your book about your daughter? It was remembering all the wonderful things that happened during that time. I think I'd forgotten a lot. And then when I started writing, I started to remember so much more and vivid memories. As I was writing, it felt like they'd happened yesterday, even though they'd happened years before. It really brought it all alive again. And I, But the best thing for me was the perspective I was able to give it and a lot of that well, was with the time and all the healing I'd done, but also this book coach and the way she asked me the questions that brought out more understanding of myself, my motives, the people around me. And so that, that was really powerful for me. So are you saying that because so much time went by and so much healing went by from the actual passing, that when you did start to write with the coach's help and like all those emotions came back, but now you were coming from a perspective of being healed from Mm -hmm. that. And you could see your life, even though you could feel all those emotions from a different consciousness, would you say? Yes, yes. And I, I mean, I had done a lot of healing over the that that 10 years before I got started. Okay. But it was the biofield tuning that the last thing I learned. And when it when I started to have sessions done on myself, that's where we I really noticed my whole perspective started to change. Wow. Um, was this before you learned biofield tuning? Or no. was this you? Oh, okay. This, okay. Yeah. Talk, can you, would you like to talk about that a little bit? I think a lot of people can benefit um, from alternative, you know, healing modalities. I know I've experienced Reiki that got me through um, 
a very bad part of my life. I had a friend uh, commit suicide and my friend Seraphis, I met her again. I won't, this is not about me, but synchronistic events led me to Reiki. I had never heard about Reiki or any kind of, you know, therapy and it helped me so much. So would you like to share with us what that was like for you, how it healed, you know, you and your body and your energy? Yeah. So biofield tuning is very different from the other things that I had uh, used to heal. The others were more like the energy psychology, looking at the emotions that I hadn't expressed or that I've maybe absorbed from others, that kind of thing, EFT, emotion code. But biofield tuning comes from a totally different perspective. And that is that we all have an electromagnetic field around our body. It's like a toroidal shaped field around us. And it was discovered quite accidentally. A lady was just playing around with tuning forks. And she discovered that as she moved the forks through the field, they would hit spots that felt like pressure waves. The fork felt like it hit something. And as she would put the fork in that spot, she was very uh, empathic. She could feel in the other person's body, she could feel emotions, traumas being dissolved. And so she discovered after many years of playing around with it, the edge of our field contains the memories, the traumas of everything that happened to us at the beginning of our life. And as you move in through the field, it's more recent things. So you can even get an approximate age when a trauma has happened, the therapist can uh, let the person know. And this technique has all these charges out in the field that are actually draining our life force energy. Mm -hmm. And once they're dissolved, we've got so much more life force energy to heal ourselves physically and be more joyful and happy with our lives. So it, it's a really amazing modality. It, that really is amazing. And, you know, so powerful because, you know, when you were speaking of repressing and suppressing emotions, you know, I'm such a big fan and, and going back to your book, you know, feeling all the emotions, you know, I had to put it down several times because I was feeling, I mean, it was like, I'm like, how, why am I feeling all these emotions? And I just kept going with it because it's so important important to allow ourselves not to analyze our emotions, but just feel them. We're here to feel. So I'm curious, do you, um, when you were writing the book, did you feel Lucy's presence throughout that process? I definitely felt her presence. And there were, th this took time for me to be as honest and as authentic as possible. And like the first writing, you know, I was as honest as I could be at that stage, but I felt like she's going, no, go deeper, go deeper. And so it's like revealing more things that maybe I was ashamed of or, or I, you know, felt guilty about. And so it's like, put that down as well. And <laughs> just kept on going, adding more that that was more making me feel more vulnerable. But I knew that actually that's where the power of this book was going to come when I became totally vulnerable so that that would help others the most. You know, if I, if I tried to keep some facade, then I was uh, missing out for myself and missing out for others. Wow, that's that's beautiful because are you saying that in, instead of being overly positive or just picking, because I did notice that when I read the book, I was thinking, oh my gosh, I don't know if I could tell, tell that part of the story. But I thought it was so courageous of you to do that because it was real. It was authentic, you know, from the challenges with her, um, you know, the physical body and, you know, not knowing how to, manipulate her body so it wouldn't the bone bones wouldn't get stressed mm -hmm. I mean just everything it I mean and it is going to help people because even if they don't have that experience I've never had that experience that you mm -hmm. had I literally felt like I was in 
your life. And that's got to be energetic. You know, I'm over here in the United States, you're in Malaysia, you know, it just, it, there's nothing else that can explain it. So mm -hmm. what, what do you, what would you say for, you know, people that um, are watching this or maybe even thinking about writing a personal story? What were your biggest challenges? Other than what you already just expressed, mm -hmm. you know, you know, going deeper, but what would you say your biggest challenge was in writing this story? It was getting started. It, it was so hard to get started. And once I started, it kind of built up momentum. And until it was just pouring out of me, I couldn't stop. And uh, I was so grateful that a friend has a beautiful property out in the jungle and she suggested I use it every week to do little writing retreats and each time I went I wrote pages and pages more and it seemed to that, that once I got started then it came but I really resisted for quite a long time even after the book coach wrote me the outline I still didn't get started <laughs> it was like almost oh 18 months after she wrote that before I actually started. So it was so, almost like you knew you had a calling, but there was some resistance. Yeah. What do you think that resistance was? It was exposing my private life to the world. You no, know, I've realized, you know, I've had kind of a facade of the teacher, the, the healer, and now anyone can read about all my downtimes, all my fears, or you know, it, it was that was the scariest part, really. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I can imagine. I mean, anybody that puts themselves out there, you know, in this like this crazy internet world we live in, right? Or even just writing a book. I mean, my God, it, it is scary. Mm -hmm. So. What, what what do you think made you just decide, all right, I'm just going to start? Hmm. It's hard to say what. I, I just knew I had to do it. Got it. And, and uh, I think there's probably enough of the healing happened that it felt, okay, I'm ready. And, you know, one of the things I, I fought against was – the book coach's suggestion that the first chapter was about her death. I I really did. I thought, why on earth would I start the book with that? Uh, and I kept thinking, that's not how you should start it. And and so I kind of had these big arguments. Why would she have said that? But then I suddenly thought, let's just try it. Let's just see what happens. All right? Maybe I'm not going to like it. Let's just see. And it was at that point, it was like, okay, just have a go. Just stop worrying and questioning and trying to overanalyze. Just do it. And, and that's when it started to flow. I have to tell you, she's brilliant because, like I said, within minutes, boom, boom. So that is, you know, tears mm -hmm. are such a good release right? If you allow them to, to come up. So, wow, I didn't think of it that way. I, it was actually healing me from my childhood wounds, even though I have no experience. It's not, you know, no experience in what you experienced. Wow. This is powerful. Be wow. So how do you think readers, you know, when they read this book, what do you think it is? I can't even pinpoint what I want to ask, but what is it do you think that will help them in their healing journey? I'm hoping that some of the questions I ask myself and as I answer those questions, it will prompt them to ask themselves those same questions. I feel that that is why I needed to go so deep and ask myself questions and and describe my journey of self-discovery 
I felt that this would help others to do it as well. So that's what I'm hoping happens. That's beautiful, right? It's it's like, you know, we have to awaken with them. So often we live like the world out there is separate from us when mm-hmm. it's all coming from within our consciousness, right? Mm-hmm. We're taught to be afraid of the boogeyman and the big bad wolf and all these crazy things. And the truth is the fe- there the ultimate truth is just love. And we put it through those filters of, of fear and limitations. And I better not start. And, oh my gosh, what if people judge me for, you know, what I did or didn't do? I mean, but wow, it, this book really is, it's almost like a healing tool within itself. Wow. Well, thanks for that. I'm, because that was really, I guess, what I was hoping. And so I'm so grateful to hear you say that. Yeah. I didn't realize it until right now because, I, you know, I, I it, it's a recent memory. And I'm thinking, I, I, I didn't put it together until you shared that, you know, intention. So, mm-hmm. you know, everybody has to read this book. <laughs> So what was the process like, you know, did when you were writing the book and you said, you know, um, she said, start at the end, basically, I mean, start at the end of Lucy's passing. How did that go for you? Yeah, I, I remembered reading a book that was all written in the present moment um, by a South American lady. And I thought, I think I need to put myself into that moment. So I wrote that first chapter, most of it in the present time, not it happened, but like I thought I'm going to put myself right back there right now. And so once I made that decision, then that chapter really did just kind of write itself. Yeah. Wow. That is a great tip for any budding writers or anybody just even that loves to read because it really did feel like I was there. Mm. Is there anything that you can think of right now that you'd like to share um, about the book or about Lucy or about who you were then versus who you are now that could help? I mean, I know that's a broad question, but anything that comes to mind that could help people in their own journey? Yes. My biggest takeaway from her life was live in the present moment Uh, because I didn't know back then. I hadn't learned about mindfulness. I, I hadn't learned, like I hadn't read Eckhart Tolle's book or I hadn't done all of that. And I spent so much time worrying about the future, worrying about how what's going to happen to her when I can't look after her anymore. It, you know, so many hours I wasted <laughs> worrying about the future that didn't happen. And my biggest regret, I, I think even my only regret was The time I wasted worrying, I wasn't enjoying the present moment as much as I could have been. And so I've really changed my life a lot since I made this realization because I've realized what's the point in projecting so far into the future when it it didn't happen. In this case, it totally didn't happen. It was all wasted energy, wasted so, so much worry so much sleep, you know, lack of sleep, worrying about these things that didn't even happen. And so I haven't made that mistake since. Wow, that's a powerful message. And sometimes, though, we do have to to go through that to actually say, that's it, I'm done. You know, there's got to be a better way. And it is, it's, it's so funny. We, we aren't taught to live in the now moment. Excuse me one second. My little dog would like to say hello to you. <laughs> this is, this is Ezzy. <laughs> oh. Say hi to Elizabeth. <laughs> oh, wow. So cute. <laughs> she's having, she's, she's 
getting jealous that I'm not paying attention to it. Anyway, so what a beautiful message stay in the present moment, because really the now moment is all we ever really have. And it's interesting when you were saying in the beginning, um, how you got to a point in your life where you could remember, you know, all the painful stuff, all the good stuff and everything, but from your now perspective, it's like, it's like when we look back, that's such a powerful teaching because when you look back on anything that might be challenging or painful and, but you're doing it from the now moment with love, mm. you don't bring that energy into the future. True. Yeah. That's the power of the now moment that we don't have to fight anything. We can just honor it and love it. So I'm just curious if you'd like to share, do you still talk to your daughter to this day? She still comes around. Yeah, she does. And in fact, uh, I'm not clairvoyant. I don't see, I, I feel and sense, but I don't see, but people come to my meditation sometimes and they say, there's a little girl skipping around the room. We don't know who she is because <laughs> they didn't even know about her. And she always presents herself as a little girl skipping and running around, which she could never do. She was in a wheelchair, you know, but that's how she portrays herself. And she's done that many times in to many different people. It's very interesting. What do you think her message is in, in that little girl skipping around? What do you think she's trying to tell everybody? Yeah, she's just full of joy. She's just full of joy. Yeah. It's like, it's almost like, you know, reading the book and listening to you speak about her now. It's that she, I feel like she's saying my mission's complete. <laughs> I can just go play and have fun. Yeah. 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 It, what a beautiful um, lesson for all of the, us. You know, a lot of people, I think, go through life feeling like, am I really making a difference? What's my life purpose? Why, you know, what am I doing with my life? That kind of thing. But the power that one child, one mother can have, I mean, even if you don't write a book, take this as almost like a message that you matter. Everybody's story matters in some yeah. way you touch, even if you only touch one other person. Yeah. It's a, a powerful bond. We're all connected somehow in this grand universe. We're all connected somehow. Yes. Yeah. So what advice would you give anybody that was thinking about writing their own book or their own personal story? I would absolutely recommend getting a book coach to help. You know, it, it really was a turning point for me. Uh, it, it cost money. You, you do need to, to get a good one. You, you need to pay uh, money, but it was money so well worth spending. And I, I couldn't have structured the book in a, in a, the way it's been structured without that help uh yeah. would you would you say that having that book coach almost opened some kind of uh or maybe cleared some some blockages or energy resistance did it give you do you feel like it gave you the confidence to keep going yeah yeah it really because she had structured all the chapters for me and I could just follow her guide map I, I just trusted that she understood. And I didn't mention that when we met, she didn't know uh, that I wanted to write a book. And I didn't know that her first book was about her and her autistic son. So she even had being a parent of a special needs child we had in common, even though Lucy's uh, disability was different. So... <laughs> Wow, that is powerful. And when we follow our, our excitement, our urges, you know, and I don't mean excitement, like, oh, jumping up and down, but something that is intriguing. 
it just, right. It's like, it's like we're being guided by something, our inner being, or I don't know the universe in some way to the right people. You don't know how, like you, your proof, you don't need to know how to write a book. You just need to be willing to follow if that's the right path for you and yeah. the people sh show up. Yeah, that's a po that's powerful. So before I, I wanted to ask you if you would do um, a little sound healing sample for us and all our viewers, would you be willing to do that today before yes, we close? Yes. But before yes. that, I don't want to forget to ask you and I'll put it in the description below, but where can viewers buy your book? It's on Amazon and Kindle. Okay. Um, for, for those outside of uh, Malaysia uh, and I will be going to Australia and um, we'll have some copies there. But for the rest of the world, it's easier just to get it from Amazon or Kindle. Okay, fabulous. And I'll get those links and I'll put them in the description, you know, in, in the video. So um, anything else you'd like to share before we uh, do the sound healing? I'll just tell you that I also created an audio book and it hasn't been uploaded yet. Uh, the, the publisher is a bit slow. He's quite busy and he hasn't uploaded it. And I'm not quite sure which platform he's going to put it on. But for people who don't want to sit down and read a book or maybe don't have the opportunity, People tell me that when they're traveling to and from work, they love listening to audio books, you know, when they're in the traffic. And so it's me actually telling the story. So oh, it's your into, voice. Yes, yes. I went into a recording studio and uh, I spoke the book. And, wow, that turned out to even be more difficult than writing it, saying it out loud. Wow, in uh, what way? The, there were certain sentences that were so raw that I just burst into tears. And I have a wonderful recording engineer that I've worked with with my music albums, and he was so patient. You know, he'd say, just go outside, take some breaths, you know, come back when you're ready. And so there were parts of it that I were very, very difficult to say with my voice. I was surprised. Do, would you like to share any of uh, those with us? That if you remember what, what choked the, you up the most? Yeah, the, the one that was the hardest that took me so many takes to say this one sentence was where I talked about, because I was so worried about her future if I wasn't around. And so I said, there was a wishing well and people were throwing their coin in and making a wish. And my wish was that she would die before me mm -hmm. or before I couldn't care for her anymore. Mm -hmm. I felt incredibly guilty for wishing that, even though it came from my deepest love for her because I didn't want her defenseless and alone and no one really looking out for her. But Oh, my goodness. To read that sentence was so difficult. Mm. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. That's powerful. And, you know, I do believe that although we're all connected, everybody has their own um, soul contract, meaning that we can't exert mm. our will onto but what a I can only imagine yeah so rereading that it did it spark that memory of that feeling yeah yeah but the, what was so interesting was that I could only tell anyone about that quite a long time after she passed mm -hmm. and then someone said to me oh that's how I feel with my special needs child I've wished the same thing and then I heard actually the, the more severely disabled a child is, the more likely the parent is to have that wish. I wasn't alone. And I had been so reluctant to tell anybody that, like, secret. But it turns out it's uh, fairly common. 
Yeah. Oh, I can, I can only imagine. I mean, all the fears and what if I go first? I mean, I can only imagine that that is absolutely a normal thought to have. Of course. I have a, my best friend, um, her son has Down syndrome, James, he's just a beautiful soul. And she tells me all the time that she's like, I don't know where he came from, but he just knows things. He's here to teach me. Mm. And would you say that Lucy's short life that she was here to teach you and maybe all of us now that her book is out there? Absolutely. I believe that many special needs children are here principally to teach their parents, but the wider world as well. And the sooner parents can stop looking at their child as, say, like a curse, even, you know, like, but see them as a gift and see that they're helping us to see that conventional life isn't the be all and end all there's so much more and particularly I've got involved with a lot of autistic children uh, they I believe are showing us we need to change society in a new way and so they are the way showers and so the sooner the parents stop trying to force them to be normal, as normal as possible, the, the then their gifts can really shine. Oh, God, I love that so much because we're all energetic beings and it doesn't matter if what disability is, they're a soul in a human body and they can feel our energy. They know when people are looking at them with pity or looking at them with love. No, everybody has a purpose. That's powerful. And you're right. I believe that, that special needs children or anybody that comes in with an unconventional path is here mm -hmm. to teach us compassion mm -hmm. and non question, You know, and to question what we think is normal. Yes. And, you know, it's, it's to expand us. There's sure. no normal. <laughs> Well, this might be a perfect place to discuss something that's a little bit out there, which I love, which is your sound. It's biofield. Tell me again, biofield tuning? Tuning. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that biofield tuning is a technique with tuning forks, but I'm also a sound therapist. And so what I want to, uh, to uh, demonstrate today is some sound therapy, uh, sound healing. Yeah. Okay, take it away. I'm, I'm ready. Right. Okay. So if everyone can just take some slow, deep breaths into the belly, and each time you exhale, just letting go a little bit more. And allow these sound vibrations to come into your body. Sound travels through water and bone more easily than air. So the sound vibrations go right into the cells of the body, which are about 70% water.